Um, and we will uh, pass to our second speaker. Uh, she is uh, Bianca van uh, Kemenad uh, from the University of Glasgow. And so the, the, floor, the floor is yours, Bianca. Thank you. All right, let me share. Okay, yeah, so thanks everyone. Um, welcome and thanks for joining my talk. Um, so let me start by saying that as Helmholtz already postulated more than a century ago, perception seems to be a process of inference, meaning that we are always trying to infer what was the most likely cause of our sensory input. So if I see something, I have some light hitting my retina and ultimately leading to some pattern of activation in my visual cortex. I'm trying to infer what was the cause of this sensation that I have. Um, this is not always easy. Um, first of all, we of course have a lot of uh, noise in our signal transmission. Um, so we have some noise in the sensory system, um, but also the sensory input itself might sometimes be noisy um, so or ambiguous. So for example, if I'm trying to talk to someone uh, at a party with a lot of background noise, the auditory signal is not very clear. Or if I wake up in the middle of the night and I look in my dark bedroom, then this pile of clothes on my chair might suddenly look a lot like a person actually sitting there. So it's not always easy to infer what was the cause of what we are perceiving. Um, so a special case of this is by stable perception. So here we have an ambiguous stimulus that has two possible interpretations and they can't be reconciled. And as a result, um, our perception fluctuates or alternates between the two possible interpretations. Um, so there are some examples of these here. So on the left, for example, you see the Necker cube, which can be perceived as a cube with its front facing either towards the upper right or lower left. And you usually alternate between those two or in the middle of the face vase illusion where you see two faces or a vase and on the right, binocular rivalry where each eye gets a different input and um, we, we, our perception alternates between the two different inputs. So it's thought that predictions play um, a large role in this. So we already know predictions really shape our perception and it's thought that such predictions can actually um, yeah, help us decide which percept has to be chosen. So as already um, described here by having colleagues uh, several years ago, um, there's this theory that we have predictive coding. So we have predictions um, shaping our perception and that they play um, a certain role here in bistable perception. So in this example, we have binocular rivalry between a face and a house, and they both lead to some sort of, kind of um, bottom up input. Um, but we might have a prediction that the input must be caused by a face. And this prediction then has a strong inf uh, influence on our perception. So it actually dominates um, our percept. So we actually perceive the face at this moment. And as a result, the prediction error of this input is very small because the, uh, what we're seeing matches our prediction. But in contrast then, the uh, prediction error elicited by this suppressed stimulus or the stimulus that is currently suppressed is getting larger and larger. So over time, this might tip the balance um, and favors the hypothesis that maybe the sensor input is actually instead caused by the house. Or if you want to put it in a more predictive coding or Bayesian uh, perspective, if we have a bistable stimulus like here, the Necker cube, they both have an equal likelihood, but we might have a certain prior, so a certain belief that the uh, input is likely caused by the second configuration and these two combine then to create this posterior distribution that favors the second configuration, which is what we're currently perceiving. But predictions there keep on being fed back into our system and shaping our, our beliefs. They are used to update our beliefs in case we're wrong. So this um, increasing prediction error might then um, change our prior. So in other words, predictions really seem to play um, a huge role in, in this bistable perception. So how can we, uh, measure this. So we know already that there is a lot of feedback input going back to V1. And according to hierarchical predictive coding, such predictions arise from higher, um, um, higher level areas, and they are fed back to lower level areas. And we know there's a lot of feedback um, connections that exist, and that would be the likely route where these predictions um, are being sent down. So how can we measure this with fMRI? Um, one uh, paradigm that has been used quite a lot now is the so-called occlusion paradigm, where you occlude a part of the scene 
Um, and as such, you block bottom-up input from this particular region. So there is no bottom-up input in that region, uh, in that area of the visual cortex that corresponds to that region. So if we see an activity here, this must be uh, related to feedback activity, as there is no feed-forward information coming there. And as indeed has been shown here by Smith and Mookley, this particular region of cortex that's not directly stimulated actually contains a lot of information about the visual scene. So in this case, they could decode what visual scene was presented to the subject. Um, right, and as um, has later been shown as well, um, this was really suggestive of predictive signaling because if we use high field fMRI, um, as in this case, seven Tesla um, high field uh, uh, fMRI, we can actually see the different cortical layers. And as we know, feed forward arrives in middle layers, but feedback um, arrives in either the deeper or superficial layers. So as such, you can actually use fMRI to really figure out what uh, information we're looking at. And as they could uh, find here, um, these occluded regions or non-stimulated regions um, actually contain information in those feedback layers, supporting the idea that we're really looking at predictive information. So what we wanted to do in this study is use this method to address this uh, idea of predictive signaling in bistable perception. So we were wondering, do such non-stimulated visual regions actually reflect the current contents of our conscious perception? So do we see predictive information in such non-stimulated regions that relate to our uh, current perception? So in order to do that, we use these bistable plate stimuli that are contained of um, two gratings that are superimposed and um, they were made bistable. So sometimes you would perceive the two gratings basically like sliding over each other in their respective directions. Uh, and sometimes you would see them integrated into one uh, stable percept of a pattern moving towards one direction. So we had four different stimulus configurations. So overall pattern direction was either to the left or to the right and the angle between the components was either 60 or 150 degrees. And crucially, we always occluded a part here of the scene. So participants were just watching this in the scanner and they were reporting their perception um, during these stimuli. So then we ran some localizers. So we used standard retinotopic mapping to delineate the visual areas and we used localizers for the, both the stimulated region, the non-stimulated region and the border area to exclude any um, voxels that were in between stimulated and non-stimulated regions. We then ran um, linear classifiers to try and classify or decode the perception of these bistable stimuli. Um, so here are just very briefly the results for um, the perception itself, just showing that these stimuli were indeed bistable and that we had fairly long phase durations, which is quite good for our fMRI analysis. And the fMRI results can actually be summarized in this just one figure. Um, you can see here the decoding accuracy um, for each of the areas split up for stimulated and non-stimulated um, areas. And as you can see, we could decode perception here uh, in all these uh, regions. And it's important to stress here that the physical stimulus was always the same. It's really just your perception here that fluctuated or alternated between the two. And that is what we are decoding here. Um, so we also had just here a control analysis where we exclude some runs with poor uh, fixation performance as indicated by eye tracking. But as you can see, results don't really change much. We can still robustly decode these um, percepts. So this uh, suggests that um, we have non-stimulated regions that actually contain here information about what we are currently perceiving. Question is, of course, where do these predictions come from? So a likely area in this case would be area V5, um, not just because it's motion sensitive, but also because it has been implicated in resolving such conflicts for bistable motion stimuli. Um, so what we did have some uh, V5 localizer data for uh, some of the participants. So we also decoded the percepts from this area. And as it might not be super surprising, you can actually decode this very well from V5 as well. Now, of course, I'm aware this does not prove that the predictions really originate in this area. It's just that if there is an area that generates such predictions, um, we should at least see a representation of those. And so this is just the first prerequisite that has to be met. So if I just want to summarize this all, what we see is that we have regions in early visual cortex that were not directly stimulated. So they did not receive any bottom-up input, but nonetheless, they contained information about the current percept 
um, during by um, visual by stability, and we can decode this um, percept from fMRI signals. So this shows that they do not only contain information about the visual context, as has been shown by uh, several previous studies, but also about the subjective interpretation of the stimulus, so we, what we decide to see in this stimulus. Um, so this suggests the idea that we have predictive feedback signaling that is involved in our bias stability, um, which is likely to arise from high areas such as V5. Now with that, I would also just like to thank my collaborators and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca. Uh, congratulations for, for your great talk and for your work. Um, so let's see the questions from the audience. We have a first one from uh, uh, Thomas. Um, what is the accuracy of the eye fixation versus the stimuli size? In other words, is it possible that the visible stimulus uh, momentarily went into the non-stimulated uh, uh, retinal field? Right, yeah, so that's the reason why we included eye tracking is a really good point because of course we have to be very careful that we don't accidentally stimulate the region that we don't want to be stimulated. So um, that is why we had the eye tracking. Um, so we located basically an area just around the fixation cross um, to uh, identify if they were really uh, fixating uh, properly. Um, and we had quite a large annulus around the fixation cross where you could still, uh, where it was still allowed to fixate, so to say. Um, and the accuracy was quite high. I don't have to quite uh, um, the exact number in my head, but I think it was something like 95% or something. So people were actually really very good at fixating. Um, so we have good evidence that their non-stimulated region was indeed non-stimulated, but that's why we also had the control where we exclude some runs where people were not fixating uh, enough. So there we have um, the criterion that if the, if the fixation was outside this annulus for a more than 5%, we exclude those runs. But we saw that the accuracy was still good. We could still decode from these regions. So I think uh, in the end, um, we always have to be very careful. But yeah, we have the eye tracking um, to ensure this. And um, also the non-stimulated region was quite high up. So we also still had the border region in between. So even if you have a tiny shift, at least we exclude the voxels that are in between stimulated and non-stimulated regions. OK, I see. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Minye. Uh, do you have a negative control area where the decoding did not work? Right. In this study, um, actually, we did not. Um, but I would assume like, that's something we could uh, look at to have some area that's completely a completely different region. Uh, I, I would assume somewhere out of visual cortex where we could show that it's uh, not possible. In the current study, we did not have this, no. Thanks. Then we have a um, last question for, from uh, uh, Haida. Um, if this is coming from V5, could you look to see if your decoder fails or not fails uh, on the same trials for V5 and your main uh, region of interest? If it is coming from V5, then this should be correlated. Right, so if I understand correctly, this would suggest that we, if we decode from V5, we see how similar the pattern is from V5 compared to V1. That's how I understand the question. Um, that's actually a good point. I haven't looked at this yet. This would actually be interesting because you would assume if the prediction come from V5 um, that the pattern should be similar. Um, so that's something we could do maybe to do a, a cross classification where we train on V5, for example, and test on V1 or vice versa. And I would assume that this works, but actually I haven't done that yet. So that's, that might be an interesting point. Yeah, thanks. Cool. It's always useful to have feedbacks and <laughs> suggestions from the, from the audience. OK, uh, thank you very much uh, again, Bianca, uh, for your presentation. And I think it's time to, uh, to move on.